All right, hello everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode 49, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And as you can see here, today we got quite a bunch of uh, pretty interesting news, pretty interesting releases, uh, and a bunch of cool demos that I managed to find on Twitter mostly, actually. <laughs> so let us get started. The first article we got here today is called How to use React Testing Library to Rewrite an Enzyme Component Tests. And it's, as the subtitle says, a mini rewrite case study of two testing libraries. So if you never tested React, Enzyme kind of used to be the state-of-the-art testing thing until the React Testing Library was released by Mr. Ken C. Dodds. And if you never used it, it is pretty damn good. So if you are still using Enzyme or you're picking the library to test React, do check out this article. It will give you a pretty good introduction into the React testing library as well as the comparison with Enzyme and why one is better than the other. In some cases, obviously, there's no such case as, you know, the ultimately good library. But I personally prefer React testing library. It's really, really good. Uh, hey, Abhi, welcome to the stream. All right, so that's basically all I have to say about the article. There is a lot of code and a lot of comparisons, and it does assume that you have a basic knowledge of React testing and understanding how the you know basic React tests work, so beware. All right, next article we got here is limiting JavaScript, question um, mark. This is a very interesting discussion that stemmed from, well, two things. First one was the WebKit issue that was open, uh, I think, last week. Um, and the second one is the new never slow mode that come into Chrome in the near future, essentially. Both uh, sort of aim to tackle the, I like, I wouldn't, <laughs> I really wanna say bloat of the web apps and web services, but that's not the right word, right? So sometimes that bloat is justified and reasonable. Other times not so much, especially when you are not working in internet, right? So um, yeah, as I said, there were two things. The first one is this WebKit issue that someone opened and he said, okay, we should have uh, hard coded limits on the size of the JavaScript that can be loaded, right? And there was a lot of discussion saying that this is silly and there's problems with it. And obviously this is, you know, a, not, a, not, a, not the very best approach to tackling the bloat problem. Now, the second thing is this never slow mode for Chrome that is already shipped in, um, when was it shipped? I think it's in, in a cannery for now, or maybe even beta already. But it's a very interesting thing. Like, uh, the idea is that it's not just limiting the JavaScript size, but also looks at the CSS, images, fonts, and connections, and also JavaScript execution, as well as features in JavaScript that are considered harmful for performance, such as document write or synchronous XHR, which is very curious. It's sort of supposed to be the evolution of, I guess, AMP for mobile devices, right? That would improve the performance and loading of uh, websites. Because we already have some browsers imposing feature limits, for example, like iOS limits the memory per website per page, right? And then there's the Chrome's no script intervention and so on and so forth. So there is more in-depth look into this uh, never slow mode in here, specifically on what are the budgets of the current implementation are, like, you know, the per image max size of one megabyte, total image budget of two megabytes, which meaning you can only load two large images per page, and so on and so forth. So there's basically a bit more insights. Uh, I think the, one of the most interesting uh, insights is that the long task limit is just 200 milliseconds for whatever long tasks you have which I think would break like majority of websites we currently have on mobile web because those things don't really tend to work really well. And then there's a bit more discussion into how big is too big. And you know, so the currently never slow mode is capped at 400, uh, sorry, 500 kilobytes. This is the download cap. So is this your min uh JavaScript. And um, the author here goes to look in the HTTP archive to see what is the amount of websites that actually have the JavaScript bundles that are less than 500 kilobytes. And turns out it's around the 60s percentile. So about a half of the websites won't really work in this mode right now, <laughs> which is kind of amusing. I would love to see that ship to production and just, I mean, obviously that won't happen, right? Because don't break the web is sort of the, um, 
paradigm of the browsers and JavaScript and everything. Uh, but it would be very interesting to see what would happen to the web if the browsers would push it more, you know, to be more performant, more efficient, smaller in size, faster for the users and so on and so forth, which is very interesting. So there's a bit more of a discussion in the article. So if the topic sounds interesting, definitely check it out. It is really, really cool. Hey, Kepler, welcome to the stream 5am. Why are you not sleeping? Like just go back to sleep. That's not what you should be doing with your life at 5am. Don't watch me at 5am. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, continuing next article we got here is building an image recognition app using onnx.js. ONNX is the JavaScript library by Microsoft for running the open neural network exchange models in the browser, right? So this is sort of alternative for Keras JS and TensorFlow JS. And this article is um, essentially a tutorial that shows you how to create a very basic uh, image recognition using ONNX JS and how to, uh, I mean, it's, it's very straightforward. There's basically pre existing models. So you just load that up and then throw an image in there and get the results. In this case, you will get the tags of objects recognized in the image. So nothing um, else I have to say about it. It's a very good starter tutorial. If you were curious about that, if you wanted to try something like that, do check it out. Uh, if that use case is not what you want, there is nothing beyond it in the article, just a very basic description of ONNX in comparison between the TensorFlow.js and Keras.js, uh, again, on a very basic level. So you won't really find anything amazing in here. All right, next article we got here is React as a runtime from Dan Abramov's blog over Reacted. And it's a very, very big article. So as you can see over here, I like this is probably half an hour read, maybe even more if you like, you know, read very thoughtfully, let's put it this way. And this is possibly the deep, how do I put it? The deepest deep dive is sounds silly, but this is what it is. It's a very, very good deep dive into a react inner workings. It is not beginner friendly, as the introduction says. And you don't really have to know all of those concepts and things that are presented in this article for working with react. But if you are working, I think this could be pretty much, I wouldn't call it life changing, but it could impact and affect the code you write and make it better because you will have a deeper understanding of how the react works, starting from the host trees. And you know, this is basically the thing that explains why is there react native react PDF react JSON or whatever, there's like 200 different uh, reacts that render things into different trees, right? So this is what happens exactly. Go into the host instances, specific renderers, react elements, and then all the other parts of react, there is a ton of them, including memoization, including reconciliation, raw models, batching, and all the other crazy things that happen in react under the hood. So if you have even slightest interest of knowing how react works, I would highly recommend just take an hour of your time sit and read this blog post. It is really, really good. Right, continuing, we got another blog from Dan Abramov, uh, called make set interval declarative with react hooks. So this one talks about how do you actually write a good uh, react hook and on an example of converting set interval into react hook that is basically declarative, right? So you can use it almost in the same way as you would use set interval, but it's going to be a hook and it's going to work way better with the react and UI. Uh, because it's going to do all the things in the background, like, you know, clean up, saving the references and all that kind of stuff. It is a very deep dive into how uh, hooks work essentially uh, in, you know, from terms of writing your own thing. And there's sort of, uh, it goes from the first attempt, which is this sort of naive way of let's just wrap it and see what happens. And it goes into a second attempt, which sort of cleans up things and makes them more, um, more imp like more declarative, right? So let's, this just makes them better, essentially. So if you are interested in hooks, if you want to know how to write them in a correct way, then well, there's no better person to learn from than Dan Abramov, the, uh, you know, one of the people working on react, essentially. So he's all uh, articles are always great. And I would highly recommend reading this one as well. There is a lot of uh, pretty good knowledge inside. So do recommend. All right, continuing, we got starting with SAS, an article that essentially walks you through the basic setup of uh, SAS and SCSS for your project. 
as well as how to configure the compilation and live server and all of that stuff. Uh, if you're already working with SAS, uh, sorry, with SAS and you already know what it is and how to set it up, you won't really find anything new here. If you were wondering what SAS is and how to get into it, then well, this is your starting point. It basically explains just about everything you gotta know, including the basic syntax of SAS, uh, mix-ins, imports, and all that kind of stuff. Basically all I have to say about it, so let's move on. Next article we got here is TypeScript versus Flow with the React in the background. A sort of comparison of using TypeScript versus using Flow while working on React apps and what kind of advantages and disadvantages each of them brings and what kind of differences they also have. So if you are curious, if you are picking between two, also, you know, the flow has not, beating, uh, has not been getting too much love lately. So I don't know, it's, it seems like TypeScript is the sort of main pick for about 95% of the community right now. But the flow seems to still, the flow team seems to be doing something in the background. We're going to have another news from them a bit later in the podcast. It's anyway, it's quite interesting to see this comparison uh, from, you know, from people who worked in them. So if you are curious, do check it out. Next article we got here is, do we still need JavaScript frameworks? And before we go to the article itself, can I just answer? Yes, yes, we do, because they keep pushing JavaScript forward. If it wasn't for React, we wouldn't have quite a lot of features that are landed in uh, ES 2018, 2019, right? And classes, for example, in JavaScript wouldn't be as popular as they are right now, which is... I mean, it's it's a great feature for JavaScript. So uh, yes, I would say we do need more JavaScript frameworks, especially if they evolve and improve what we have right now, right? Because React honestly changed the way that I work. But going back to the article. So the article actually talks about uh, the current ways of building the applications without using any frameworks, specifically with using things like web components or HTML elements or... Um, history API and writing your own router, which is, I mean, I guess you can do that, but uh, it's not very nice, right? So it's like, yes, you can do it if you need a very slim and small app, but it is a bit of a pain in the ass. But nonetheless, it does goes to talking about the cons and pros of this. So it's quite uh, nicely weighted and looks at not just advantages, but also disadvantages. And uh, yeah, it's like if you ever wanted to write an app that is super small, super fast and doesn't require any framework, then this is a pretty good starting point. It will also teach you uh, or explain, I guess, the cons of doing that and uh, show you all the upsides of doing it. So if you are interested, do check it out. Next article we got here is UI as an afterthought. And even though this article does talks technically about the JavaScript, React, and MobX, it is more of a business logic side of article. So rather than talking about the specific technical implementations, it talks about the fact that the UI is often an afterthought, right? So the idea is that when you start front-end development, when you start building a new product, you typically start from mock-ups and thinking about how fancy UI should look, right? And most of most most often that is actually not a very good approach because it distracts you from thinking about your state. And here's an interesting statement that I think the, my, my most favorite quote from here is, uh, state is the root of all revenue, which is actually very on point. So if you ever build any product that you ship to the customers, you know that Essentially, managing state is related to your revenue pretty much directly. So if you, are, if you are curious about sort of business logic side of building UIs and open to rethinking the way that you think about the UI's design and implementation, I would highly recommend reading through this article. It's not very long, but there is a lot of very interesting thoughts and uh, a lot of thought-provoking things here. So quite highly recommend it. Continuing, we got building super fast apps in Node.js using Redis cache. This is a pretty basic tutorial on how to use Redis for caching requests in your ExpressJS server. Nothing really super fancy here, but if you never did anything like that or you never worked with Redis, then this basically will give you a very good introduction to it. If you already worked with Redis, if you know how caching works, uh, you, I mean, using not, not specifically Redis, just any key value store really, then you won't really find anything new here. Next article we got here is introduction to TurboFan. 
I also want to complain a bit about this website. It doesn't let me zoom in because <laughs> it just breaks the layout and I cannot read it. So yeah, um, Donna, thank you very much for your donation as always highly appreciated. And yes, welcome to the stream. So introduction to Turbofan. This is a very deep dive article into the Turbofan, which is one of the parts, uh, the JIT compiler specifically of the V8 JavaScript engine. And this is an introduction to it from the reverse engineer standpoint. So the, uh, the article is incredibly large. There is a ton of code snippets and low level insights into how it works. But if you ever was curious about the turbofan and all the insights that, you know, the inner workings that it has, because this thing is incredibly complex, then this article will explain, I guess, majority of it. So I am not an expert again, you know, in this area, I am uh, terrified of low level programming, especially when it relates to this, I know basic concepts and understand them. But some of this stuff is absolutely fascinating. So if you are curious do have a read through, you will uh, definitely be entertained at least. Next article we got here is probably my favorite one in this podcast, uh, rethinking technical writing. Can Poet provide a better experience? So I think we had the code Poet tool uh, last podcast, if I remember correctly. And this is sort of the expanded look on what code poet can do to enhance the technical writing. So code poet was this uh, browser writing tool that actually supported git like commits where you, you know, you can actually change, uh, change your text and then commit it and then look at the history and stuff like this, which looked pretty neat. Now what they also allow is rendering all of those things as a markdown. And um, an, an example here is this uh, blog from the uh, Dan why isn't X a hook that shows the code snippets and then uh, shows the text below it where you can you know, we kind of have to manually connect the snippets in the text with what you see in the code, right, which can be a bit hard sometimes. So the code poet actually offers you a way to uh, hover over the bit of a text, and it will automatically highlight the bit of code that is relevant in a snippet above, which I think is really cool feature. There's a live demo over here, which you can see in action. And it works surprisingly well, like you can highlight the bit of code, and it will show you the explanation in text. And I think this is really, really cool. Uh, there's, I guess, one minor nitpick from my side is the fact that it doesn't actually show you any actionable snippets. So as in you don't know what you can hover over, especially when it's like, you know, the tiny ones like variables. The other way around, it actually works really well. So it's a pretty cool uh, look into how we can make the technical writing better, I guess. At the core, it is a markdown editor with just some neat features. But man, this looks really cool. Um, the other neat feature is that it actually allows you to embed the literal like code snippets using the editor itself, which is also really neat. And uh, yeah, if, if you are interested, do check it out. Yes, it is called poet.codes. The, the website is this literally and uh, I think it's just poet editor basically. But it's, it's, it's really neat. Um, yeah, it's just called poet. So there you go. Check it out if you are interested. Right, continuing, we got new features and webpack dot five, oh, sorry, dot five and webpack five, right? So webpack version five is coming out relatively soon. I think there's already alpha version, if not RC, maybe even it has been quite some days since I checked last. But yeah, this is an overview of what is coming in version five, what changes are going to happen, what is going to break, what is going to be deprecated, and what is going to be added, essentially, right? So if you are curious about the changes and want to prepare your own code base, for example, if you are using Webpack manually, then I would highly recommend to looking through this read. I mean, it's not really large. It's like yeah, seven minutes read as the medium says. Um, that's, you know, a nice overview of essentially of the changes. And uh, basically, once you read through this, you will be prepared to upgrade to version five without much problems. Right. Next thing we got here is React Hooks, the reverse of state management and beyond. This is a look at uh, how the hooks release will actually affect the state management in React. The cool thing is that uh, this snippet they have in the beginning, 21 lines of code, is literally all you need right now in React to manage global state. Like unless you need something that is, you know, way more complex, 
this is basically all you need, which is kind of incredible. It's like, you know, majority of time you won't even need a certain, uh, third party libraries. Like you can use them, but what's the point if you can write it yourself in, in literally two seconds. And this article expands a bit more on, you know, how that works, how exactly does this code functions in terms of application, how does it scales and so on and so forth. And what kind of the future uh, you can expect in terms of hooks and state management, which is also quite interesting. So if you're working with React and state management, do check it out. It is quite interesting. Next article we got here is JavaScript regular expressions for regular people. This is an introduction to regular expressions for people who know nothing about regular expressions, essentially. If you already worked with regular expressions, you won't find anything new or amazing here. It's very basic stuff, essentially. If you are still struggling with regular expressions or you know just trying to learn them now, this is a pretty good introduction uh, with uh, very concise and easy to read explanations. Do check it out. This is basically all I have to say about it. Next thing we got here is a guide to prototype based class inheritance in JavaScript. And it is yet another one of those guides that basically introduce you to prototypical inheritance in JavaScript, or how the classes works, how the prototypes works. Nothing super complex here. If you already know all of that, you won't find anything new. If you don't know that, that's a really good article that explains most of the things quite well. So I uh, recommend it read if you are just getting started, for example. Right. Next thing we got here is new JavaScript features that will change how you write regular expressions. This article is essentially overview of the new regex features that have been added in ECMAScript 2018, specifically look behind named capture groups, dot all flag and Unicode uh, property escapes. It's just a bit more extended than, you know, naming them and essentially showing how they work and what you can do with them. Um, if you ever written any other language than JavaScript, then you likely know all of those features because they've been in other languages for ages and JavaScript just finally got them, which is kind of great. But yeah, if you already know them, there's just a basic overview. If you never heard about those features, I would highly recommend looking at this because they are like, those features are really good and they will help you write simpler and faster regular expressions that are easier to understand essentially. So uh, yeah, that's basically all I have to say. Next thing we got here is what hooks mean for view and a sort of insight into what and how the hooks uh, approach will change the Vue.js with the Vue 3.0 release, I guess. And yeah, there's some examples here, some sort of insights into what kind of hooks the Vue ecosystem have, um, are looking to have, how they will actually change how you write Vue components, and what does it mean in sort of, uh, you know, future work for Vue. The hooks are, by the way, planned for the Vue 3.0 release which comes at one point, I'm not sure when, but yeah, if you are using Vue and are interested in hooks, do check it out. This is a pretty good overview of the upcoming changes. Next thing we got here, and I think this is our last major article today, obfuscated JavaScript, scam emails and American Express. Uh, this is a very, very cool write-up on uh, sort of disassembly and deobfuscation of a malicious codes that was sent in a American Express looking email that looks very legit and um, sort of fakes you, you know, it's, it's usually, it's, it's typical phishing, right? So it redirects you to a page where you should enter your credentials and they just steal them, right? The way that they lead you to that page though is very elaborate, starting from the email that actually looks like coming from a legit domain and go into the headers, go into the bunch of different servers in the middle, go into this very elaborate JavaScript file that is also obfuscated and that uses some crazy approaches to call in the codes to make it even harder to figure out what the hell is it doing. Um, yeah, it is, it is absolutely fascinating. If you are ever interested in sort of code obfuscation and deobfuscation, reverse engineering, and I guess you are curious about how these scammers and fishers try to trick you, I would highly recommend looking through this article because there is some absolutely crazy things happening. So it's uh, pretty cool. All right, that is it for uh, major articles. Now we're coming to the smaller bit-sized awesomeness tips and tricks. The first one we got here is please don't overchain array methods. And it talks about improving the performance of, you know, using the map, reduce, filter, and all the other array methods. If you didn't know, each of those methods effectively creates a new array that is, you know, 
created by iterating over the old array. So obviously that is not very efficient performance wise. The author talks about what you can do to actually make it more performance, like for example, combine several maps into one or combine maps into reduce. If you know, the examples here are basic mathematical operations, which are obviously very easy to combine. But um, so the thing I have to say about this is while this is true, right? So while this definitely gives you optimizations and we definitely will improve the runtime and everything, I personally think that a bunch of filters is easier to read than this, right? Like, right, this, if you compound, like if you combine all of this into one expression, it might be faster, but it might be so much more painful to read that I don't know if it's worth it. So the question, uh, like the, what I wanna say is, while this is absolutely a valid point, you should not optimize before you actually hit the problems with your code. So unless you already have a problem, unless you see that your filters and maps and reduces produce so much duplicate arrays and the garbage collection doesn't kick in enough and you know doesn't optimize your code enough and it's just slow and you need to optimize, then yes, take it and optimize it and make it faster. I mean, if you're hitting these problems, maybe you don't have to use the dot filter, maybe you just use a normal four, which will be even faster because it doesn't have to produce a new array, right? Um, on the other hand, yeah, like the people compare, it's like, yeah, it can give you a boost from six milliseconds to one milliseconds, but the question you should be asking is, is it worth it? Like, is this readability worth, uh, you know, sacrificing readability worth this four milliseconds? Might not be but depending on your data, it might as well be. So just, you know, take this into account. Next thing we got here is Electron version 500 timeline. And it's an outlook into the upcoming Electron 5 release and how they are finally caught up with the latest Chrome version, which is kind of great. And uh, it looks like they are, their aim is to try and uh, go as close as possible to the latest Chrome release. For now, they, for some, I'm like, there's obviously some reasons uh, that they cannot stay completely up to date because Chromium and Chrome get released every three months, I think, right? The major release. No, wait, that's the Electron. The Chrome actually gets released every, what was it? Couple of weeks, maybe months, but basically, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting insight and very interesting uh, outlook as you know, how they actually sped up the whole process and caught up with the Chrome and hopefully will keep updating it uh, to the late and think maybe even figure out a way to do that consistently and always be on the latest version. That would be like the best thing, obviously. But yeah, we'll see. Next thing we got here is a more responsive flow, an article about the new version of flow, which is the version 0.92.1 that uh, sort of changes the flow server to dynamically or immediately answer commands like autocomplete and get def without actually recomputing the type information the way that it worked before, which made it feel very slow, right? So right now we just immediately answer it, which actually improves response time by 95%, which is just insane when you think about it. So yes, flow doesn't seem to be very dead. It just seems to be very slowly moving. And uh, maybe maybe one day it uh, reaches the TypeScript um, velocity, although I don't know. I'm, at this point, I'm a bit skeptical about it. But if you are using flow, this is some very good news for you. Next thing we got here is generating PDF from HTML with Node.js and Puppeteer. Essentially a very basic tutorial on how to use Puppeteer to grab a web page and save it as PDF. And uh, yeah, it's like, um, or I guess rather there's like a couple of solutions, right? So first one uses the HTML to canvas and GS PDF. And the second one uses Puppeteer, which is, I think would be more precise than the first one because you're literally just using the browser, right? Obviously it would be more, um, what do you call it? Memory heavy and resource intensive, let's put it this way, but yeah, it's, I guess, most precise one. So if you are curious at how to, you can save a page to PDF, then well, there, there you go. This is a pretty good introduction to that. Next thing we got here is playing with React hooks and web workers. A very short look into how you can use web hooks, uh, sorry, React hooks and web workers to move in a heavy, like, you know, God damn it. Let me try this again. To move the heavy lifting work, like for example, in this case, the Fibonacci calculation into a web worker thread to improve your UI rendering performance. And there's a nice code of uh, like code snippet here that shows you pretty 
uh, nicely how you know if you calculate Fibonacci in the main thread your UI will start you know the lo larger the number the slower the UI will get it drops from like 50 FPS to 20 30 and so on and so forth lower and lower depending on the Fibonacci calculation number and once you move it to web worker you get consistent 60 fps which is pretty great and seems to be quite easy to do with the webhook so there is a use worker hook now so yeah why why not use that that seems to be pretty straightforward so pretty cool next thing we got here is the introduction of the lighthouse platform packs that are currently under development it is a new feature for lighthouse in chrome which will detect platform and tools that are being used on a page and um, add additional platform specific recommendations, which is freaking amazing. So Lighthouse is already a very cool tool that will tell you a lot about your website and a lot about how you can make it better. And now with those tools, it will actually tell you specific things about the tools that are using. For example, here on the screen right now, you can see that it tells that, okay, you're using React, but you can also use React Lazy to reduce how much scripts are being loaded up front and use the code splitting guides to do this specifically, which is just fantastic. So I cannot wait for this feature to land. It seems like a very, very, like Lighthouse is becoming this super powerhouse that essentially tells you how to fix your website and make it super fast, which is great. Like, like I love it. All right. Next thing we got here is type-driven development, replacing unit tests with types in TypeScript. Essentially it talks about how the TypeScript can actually a lot of times replace the very basic unit test and make sure that your code works, which makes perfect sense. Uh, but as a person who never uses TypeScript, I you know can't really comment much on this. If you are using TypeScript or considering it, do check it out. Maybe this is something useful for you. Um, next thing we got here is a scenic iteration has landed in the stream spec. So you will soon be uh, by spec able to for await iterates of the stream. For example, the fetch response body, which is kind of awesome. This looks absolutely great and I love it. Like a sync await was one of the best additions to JavaScript in my opinion. And like awaiting, you know, a sync iteration over streams look just as awesome. So there you go. Next thing we got here is the announcement of uh, React hooks will be officially shipping in React Native version 0 0.59, which should be quite soon-ish, I guess. So if you're working with React Native and are waiting for hooks, then there you go. This is gonna be uh, pretty awesome in my opinion. I cannot wait for that. Next thing we got here is um, use web app versions instead of Electron. Uh, this is an article that I, I mean, <laughs> It's not exactly JavaScript related, but I just thought that I would highlight this because this is what I've started doing recently as well. So instead of installing all those Electron apps on my system, it actually turned out that majority of those apps work perfectly fine as a Chrome frame. Like uh, for example, instead of installing Discord that looks like this, you can just use it as a web tab that looks exactly similar. Like there is no difference. What cooler is Chrome allows you to actually install those and run those as a separate window. So if I go now to chrome.apps uh, slash slash apps, sorry, I have my bunch of apps, right? And if I launch Discord over here, it will launch as a window, like a standalone. It will have its own icon in a toolbar and it has its own ecosystem and I can essentially works in exactly the same way as the one that I can install using the Chrome, right? Uh, sorry, the Electron, but way more efficient because it just, you know, it's just the same Chrome browser. It doesn't install additional environment, doesn't run additional Chrome browser. It is way lighter and way faster. So if you are, if you wanna uh, decrease the amount of apps that you have on your platform and just use web platform, then there you go, you can do that. It's quite neat. Right, next thing we got here is Google Analytics feature that I did not know about. Maybe you also didn't know about that it can show which of your pages are actually loading slower than the others. Uh, I think this is a new feature and it also shows the timings for average across all the users that visit your website. So you can actually debug and figure out why your pages are slow, which is kind of neat. So uh, do check this out. And the last thing we got here is the uh, quick overview of the new ES2000 19 array features that just landed in v8 7.3 and chrome 73 uh, specifically flat map uh, flat and object from entries um, 
they are really straightforward, but if you needed an introduction, then just uh, check it out. This is a pretty good overview. That is it for short things. Now we're coming to the releases. And as I already mentioned, the first major release of the week is V8 version 7.3 that enabled the async stack traces by default that will show you way better async, you know, promises, async await and so on and so forth, stack traces. Hopefully this will land in Node.js quite soon because those look absolutely amazing. It also added faster await and faster VASM startup. Like, look at this improvement. This is just like, <laughs> every time I see the charts from the V8 team, it blows my mind. How can they improve the performance so much every freaking time? Just look at this change. From one second on 32-bit architecture to 750, like, okay, 800 minutes. That's, that, that, this is insane. And yeah, that's also additional JavaScript language features. Um, the ones that the was reviewed in the previous article, specifically object from entries, string prototype match all and uh, array flat flat map, I believe. And uh, yeah, it's it's great. So you can now install the Chrome uh, beta version with this engine inside if you are curious, or you can wait a bit and it's gonna be released uh, to the stable in just a couple of weeks, basically. Next thing we got here is React version 16.8, the one with hooks. The hooks version of React has finally been released and you can now use that in production and it works really well. I've already included it in a couple of my websites. No problems whatsoever. There is, <clears throat> if you use the hooks in the beta version or pre-release basically, there is one change you will need to change your tests because they've added the act util in the test utils that basically triggers all the effects and the other hooks that are not triggered normally. So if you are updating, then make sure to uh, check this out. Okay, next release we got here is React Spring version eight, which essentially just changed the, so the render props are now old, old import and the default import are now actually hooks because hooks are now shipped and uh, hooks are, especially for React Spring, hooks are way easier to use than everything else. And uh, yeah, if you never tried it, React Spring is an amazing React animation library, so check it out. Next release we got is Vue 2.6, which is essentially just a bunch of improvements. It adds uh, vslot syntax changes and um, I, yeah, I, you know, I'm not using Vue, so I can't really tell you much about that. But if you are using Vue, do check it out. Maybe there are some improvements that you've been waiting for. Next release is uh, VS Code version 131, bringing you another amazing, incredibly long patch notes. Uh, I will just highlight my favorite release. You no longer have to reload the whole thing, the whole IDE on extension install, which is just absolutely awesome. Also, tree UI improvements and other things that make it better and uh, 2 million features that I would probably never use, but still look really, really cool. So if you're using VS Code, make sure to update. It will only get better. Um, I like Vue. Yeah, Donna, Vue.js is awesome. I like it as well. I used it in a couple of minor projects, but I just prefer React, uh, basically primarily for functional components. Maybe when Vue 3.0 is shipped, I will switch to it because they they are planning to have functional components there. But okay, continuing. Next release we got here is lit HTML 1.0 and lit element 2.0, which is the parts of the Polymer projects that allows you to write fast templates and components and super tiny packages. Um, it's basically wrappers around HTML components, shadow DOM and all that kind of stuff. They are quite easy to use. Like I really like the syntax. They do make writing web components way simpler. Uh, so if you are looking into that, do check it out. This seems to be a really cool release. Next thing we got here is ESM version 3.2.4, a minor release, but I wanted to highlight it because it finally adds uh, support for STD in eval, where you can use the RSM flag and then just eval whatever you want in using imports. And that works really well. So it's kind of kind of cool. ESM keeps being awesome. Right, that is it for releases. Now we are coming to the demos, libraries, and all that kind of stuff. We got quite a bit of them today. So the first one is Intel date format. It allows you to format a date using Intel .date format, uh, date time format goodness. Um, yeah, it's not much to say. It basically allows you to format things using locales and time zones, which looks kind of nice. So maybe I will even use it at one point. 
Next thing we got is uh, React Insta Stories, a React component for Instagram Stories. You can now integrate Instagram Stories that actually look quite good into your website, even when you don't need them. So please don't do that, but um, it actually looks really sleek. So if you ever wanted to make an um, Instagram competitor that is purely a progressive app app, now you can. Uh, continuing, we got Messenger. Messenger app built with React. This is essentially just a one-to-one -one copy, as far as I understand, of Facebook Messenger uh, that is built React. I guess it will work as a sort of learning material. Other than that, I don't know why would you need that, but there you go. <laughs> Continuing, we got Mini Search, tiny but powerful full text search engine for browser and Node, yet another one. For some reason, we had like 10 of them in the past three or four podcasts. <laughs> So if you are looking for yet another one search engine, full text search engine for a browser or node, do check it out. This seems to be quite nice. Next thing we got here is Tix. Uh, it is a serverless backend framework in TypeScript for Amazon Web Services Lambda. It has declarative dependency injection and event bindings. It seems to be very complex. I have very limited experience of working with Lambda and um, anything related to it. So I can't really comment much about that. But if you are working, do check it out. Maybe this is something that you wanted. Next thing we got here is React Smooth Range Inputs, which is a beautiful React range sliders, which actually look really slick. And you can also like disable animations. You can also change the styling, remove pop-ups and have a completely different custom styling, which Looks pretty slick. So, you know, if you ever wanted to have a very slick um, slider, there you go. This looks very good, actually. Continuing, we got Readability, a standalone version of Readability Leap from Mozilla that allows you to extract content from the page. Uh, unfortunately, it only works with the browsers and requires a DOM. Uh, but, you know, if you're using Firefox Reader View, this is essentially what they use under the hood. So if you ever wanted to make your own extension that does this, do check it out. Seems to be pretty good. Next thing we got here is React Schema Org, a type checked Schema Org JSON LD for React. Allows you to build JSON LD using React components. I, I don't, like, honestly, I don't think you should ever build JSON LD stuff by hand. It is always a pain in ass and it's not the best format to work with. But if you ever need to inject it using React, well, now you can. Although, I, I don't know. I, I just, I don't know if I would use that, but there you go. Maybe you would. All right, continuing, we got Laszlo DB, portable, compact, and serverless NoSQL database built using Node.js and Message Pack. Yeah, this basically says everything. It's just NoSQL database that you can install using npm and then just run locally. It seems to, you know, be all in one thing. Um, maybe good for testing, maybe good for embedded systems. Haven't tried it. Cannot really say much about it, but uh, seems okay. Continuing, we got CoEFX, a node and JavaScript library that helps developers describe side effects as data in a declarative flexible API. So more functional programming, um, describing side effects. I, yeah, I don't know. I never needed anything like that. Uh, but I, then again, you know, I'm not strictly a functional programming person. I do like a lot from functional programming concepts. And this is why I like JavaScript because it allows you to sort of mix and match object oriented like classes with functional programming. Uh, but I never really gotten into doing anything like this, for example. But if you are, you know, hardcore functional programming guy, do check it out. Maybe this is what you were looking for. Next thing we got here is Pika Pack, uh, NPM package building reimagined. This is a um, command line tool that allows you to package your project using sort of preset predefined pipelines that are installed like packages, oh, sorry, plugins, like the Babel way, you know? You sort of install the Pika Pack and then you define the pipelines. For example, you wanna define the build node, build web, build types. And then everything else is supposed to be handled by the Pika Packager. Um, it looks kind of cool, but I don't know how good is it. And I don't know how reliable will those packages be produced and how configurable they are. But I do like the idea of sort of all-in-one packager that would just package my library for web node to add types automatically and release it to whatever things that I want, essentially. This sounds like a really cool and I'm gonna be tracking this project for sure. Next thing we got here is Notion, the hassle-free JavaScript toolchain manager. 
Uh, this project looks really interesting. So it's written in Rust and it's sort of installed as a binary to just about any platform. And what it does is that it gives you one command that allows you to manage node versions, uh, pin those node versions for the specific project, and install and manage packages um, that you use instead of NPM, it seems. At least this is my understanding of it so far. Maybe I am misunderstanding that, but I've seen, you know, like for example, they install this ViewPress, which is definitely the node package, right? The NPM package. But they also pin the versions of Node and Yarn and all that other stuff locally. So sort of everyone who works on the same project has the same pinned versions and they always use them for building, running, and so on and so forth. It sounds interesting, but I uh, would need basically to spend more time to actually give you my you know, proper opinion on what the hell's going on here because I'm not sure I completely understand it. But if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Seems to be like a curious thing that might bring some um, advantages to a large teams, especially. Right, next thing we got here is CSS Jojo, generate random CSS. Uh, if you ever needed to generate random CSS for some reason, there you go, now, now you can do that. I, I'm not sure why you would need that, probably for testing something, but yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, why for testing, obviously. So this is the only case. I guess you would wanna generate it for breaking something as well, but there you go. If you needed that, check it out. Next thing we got here is React Word Art. You can now build word art in React. Yes, that word art that looks absolutely terrible. And <laughs> I don't know why you would want that as well, but there you go. It's, it's actually like proper fonts and everything. And you can even select them and copy and paste, which is amazing to be honest. But uh, yeah, and you can even type it. Oh, holy shit. Okay, this is even more impressive. I haven't tried that. <laughs> All right, you can do a word art with your React components. Right, um, next thing we got is Twitch Highlighter. This one is really, really cool. It's a VS Code extension that allows your Twitch viewers to actually highlight the code that you are working on. And I cannot wait to try it out on our next developer stream. So we are gonna see how that goes and um, hopefully you guys can help me fix my bugs. <laughs> Let's see how that works out. Okay, next thing we got here is Rooks a collection of React hooks for everyone. That's literally what it says. It's a pretty large collection of a lot of different hooks that you can use in React. Uh, there's a really nice documentation here, basically telling what they do. There's stuff like use timeout, use interval, use input, and a bunch of others. So there you go. All right, next thing we got here is OpenType.js. Read and write OpenType fonts using JavaScript. Um, it seems like it literally allows you to read and write fonts, uh, like OpenType fonts. I don't know why, but I guess maybe for gaming using Canvas, that seems like a very weird and very specific tool. So if you know why you would want to use that, go ahead and look at it. It looks pretty awesome, but I, yeah, I just, I never needed anything like this. <laughs> All right, continuing, we got Vixel, a WebGL voxel path tracer, which looks absolutely awesome. If you ever wanted to work with a voxel pass or anything in WebGL, check this out. I, again, you know, I have zero knowledge of WebGL. I have zero knowledge of anything related to 3D, essentially, just a very basic one. And um, this just looks really good. So uh, do check it out. Okay, continuing, we got Dumper.js, a better and pretty variable inspection for your Node.js applications. Um, this looks a lot like PHP dump methods and you cannot argue it's, it's quite much more readable than the default uh, way of printing things into console. But yeah, I guess, you know, if you ever needed that, do check it out. Otherwise, I don't know if you want to drag another package into your uh, thing just for pretty printing variables. Does it have any dependencies? It actually has four dependencies. <laughs> like, um, yeah, maybe not, but there you go. Maybe you just want to pretty print something. All right, continuing, we got Flowage, easy transformation and filtering for Node.js streams. This looks like a lighter version of Highland.js, my favorite stream library, but you know, maybe you wanted something simpler, then do check this out, seems to be quite nice. Next thing we got here is Mercury Parser, extracting content from chaos of the web. Uh, essentially a thing that allows you to extract 
Well, a bunch of metadata from page, including title, content, author, um, excerpt, domain, and all that kind of stuff that you typically have in meta text. Not sure what kind of uh, open graph or Twitter graph data does it uses. I'm, it doesn't really describe anything that much. But yeah, maybe you were looking for something like this. Next thing we got here is Typekit, most versatile animated typing utility on planet. It allows you to declaratively describe what to type and how to type it, and then also manipulate it as in, you know, to delete some stuff, pause, change the speed, and type some other stuff, which looks pretty nice and I guess could be used for the landing pages and demos pretty neatly. Uh, seems like there are different license options, so beware, it is actually a commercial license. I have missed that, but you know what? It looks cool, so maybe you need that. It is 20 bucks for commercial license, so not that much. Right, continuing, we got Core minimal interactive command line prompts. Uh, seems to be very similar to Inquirer and Enquirer that we reviewed a couple of podcasts ago. Um, yeah, it essentially allows you to ask user different questions. There is a ton of different prompt types, including passport, password, input, confirm, uh, and so on and so forth, quizzes and yeah, it's it looks fine. Like I don't think it has as many command prompts as the inquirer or enquirer, but maybe you wanted something smaller and simpler. Next thing we got here is Web Authn Guide. It is a website that introduces you to Web Authentication API, which has been shipped, I think, in the most of the Edge, like the Evergreen browsers, which is kind of awesome. So it shows you how you can use web, web auth api to authenticate to sign stuff and to public key registration and all that kind of things it it is quite good it's a very good tutorial essentially so if you are interested in this kind of um, web authentication api do check it out right and the last thing we got in demos is tiny go you might be wondering why the hell am i showing the golang compiler in in javascript podcast well it's because this one allows you to compile go into WebAssembly. So you can actually now take this tiny Go compiler, take your Golang code and compile it into WebAssembly, load it into Node.js and run it as a WebAssembly module, which actually sounds like something I would wanna try because Golang can be quite cool for some very specific high performance cases, which is absolutely awesome. So there you go. Uh, before I wrap this up, I have two additional things to show you, which are non-JavaScript related, but can be quite awesome for you know web development and just general development. First one is the Maker Terminal Command Palette. It's a tool that allows you to search for common command templates, uh, as in, for example, you can find the common way to use curl as a post request. It uses the TLDR tool to find those and then just you know templates it for you so that you fill in the commands, which looks absolutely awesome. It's like, I don't have to remember things anymore. I can just use that. So there you go. If you are uh, as forgetful as I am with the regards to command line utils, check out the maker, seems to be very nice. And the last thing I wanna highlight is cluster fuzz, uh, which has the tagline, all your bugs are belong to us. It's Google, a uh, tool from Google uh, that does the fuzzy testing of infrastructure. So that we talked about the fuzzy testing of uh, code at one point, right? When you mutate the tests and check what breaks and then the mutant stays and say, okay, this actually broke it. So you should check it. This does the same, but for the infrastructure. So actually it starts mutating your infrastructure and uh, seeing where the crashes or bugs will happen, which Sounds absolutely insane, but if you are working in DevOps, then you likely are gonna go crazy about that because this looks really, really cool. And um, yeah, they say they already found uh, more than 16,000 bugs in Chrome and 11,000 bugs over 160 open source projects integrated with OSS FAS, which is pretty damn impressive. And this is just as of January 2019. It was released quite recently, so... Yeah, looks pretty damn awesome. So do check it out. All right, that is basically it from my side. Um, as usual, you can find all those links on the GitHub. The link is in the channel description or video description or sound description, wherever you're watching or listening this. If you have any questions right now, do feel free to throw them into chat. I will be more than happy to answer them. As usual, you can join our Discord server if you want to chat. And uh, yeah, this is basically all I have for today.
Right, so we got some link from code together. What is this? This is FX, a command line tool and terminal JSON viewer. I believe I've seen it at one point. So what does it actually do? Oh, that's fancy. Okay, so it's actually like a JSON inspector with a nested JSON and stuff and also queries. Oh, that looks really cool actually. Okay, I um, I don't remember if we had it in BXJS at one point because I feel like I've seen that at some point. And now I don't think I've actually, I should probably, yeah, we had it, okay. We had it in episode 36 actually. So there you go, it is the same tool, right? Yep, so it is a very new tool. I already forgot about that, but we did cover it at one point. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, uh, so yes, as I was saying, we have a Discord channel, uh, we have a Discord server actually. So if you want to chat about JavaScript, if you need help or just want to hang out and talk about video games, do feel free to join it. More than happy to talk and help you with your JavaScript bows. As usual, uh, there's going to be a development stream on Wednesday evening. We are continuing to build the BXJS website, which is currently deployed as a demo version over here, which has all the episodes rendered nicely in HTML, as well as the search over all episodes and stuff like this. Um, other than that, yeah, I guess thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. I hope you enjoy the podcast. If you somehow missed it, you can watch it on YouTube afterwards. Listen it on uh, iTunes or Podster or whatever the hell where I publish it. I don't even remember. The links are as always in the description. Um, yeah, that's basically all I have to say. Thank you guys very much for watching. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.